Good morning, and uh, thank you, Bina, for that uh, introduction, and thanks to uh, Rakesh and the organizers for uh, having me here. There is uh, a revolution going on in the field of cancer genomics, and uh, we believe that IBM and Watson Health can make a difference. So back in the early 90s, Bert Vogelstein, who a lot of you who have been in the field of genomics uh, are probably very familiar with, proclaimed that cancer is a genetic disease. And it has been proven true over the last 20 plus years since that. In fact, in 2017, this year, there was a paper from Bert Vogelstein and uh, Kristen Tomasetti actually saying that 66% of all cancers are pure bad luck. And uh, it's interesting that from that proclamation in 1990, to 2017, how the thread connects itself. So let's take a step back. What causes cancer? A number of things. Inflammation causes cancer. Family history, we know about uh, the germline mutations that are carried on that can cause cancer. Infection, we have heard about the HPV disease and how it can actually lead to cancer, the virus. The uh, DNA damaging agents. So what are some of the DNA damaging agents? Smoking. That's, uh, that actually attacks the DNA and causes damage. Radiation in scans can also cause cancer. Time. So cancer is a disease still of old age, mostly. It's typically between 65 and 75 that most cancers strike. And bad luck. 65% of all cancers may not have any real causes, except that in the precancer and the cancer cells, you see the mutations. In normal cells, you do not see any mutations. So that is what distinguishes cancer cells from normal cells. Now, the path to cancer could take decades. Shown on the top left is, uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on colon cancer here, normal colon epithelia, so the surface of the colon. From the normal, you can go to the pre-malignant, which would take around 20 years to proceed to a polyp. From a polyp to invasive cancer, it could take another 10 years. And then from invasive to metastatic, it could take another 10 years before you get to a stage where you're in a very advanced stage of cancer. The good news is, along the way, there are several mutations which either can be caught through biopsies when you do a colonoscopy and take out some tissue, or you could catch it in stool, you could potentially catch it in blood, as a lot of the DNA fragments from the cancer cells actually float in the, uh, in the blood. So that's the good news. The bad news is most of the cancers are caught at a late stage. With genomic sequencing and the cost of genomic sequencing coming down, it has been a tremendous boon to actually understanding cancer. But still, the cost of interpretation of the sequencing is going up with more and more discoveries being made with whole exome sequencing. The cost of actually understanding what to do with the sequence information is on its way up. And that's where IBM and Watson Health come in to bend that cost curve, if you will, of genomic interpretation and ultimately having actionable insights, as Bina said, um, with the information that we have. So thanks to uh, companies like Illumina and others, we know a lot about the cancer genome. We have a new whole new vocabulary for cancer. And uh, whether it's glioblastoma or pancreatic cancer or colorectal cancer, we understand quite well at this point the series of mutations that lead from precancer to early cancer to late stage cancer, both in uh, adults as well as in pediatrics. Now, exome sequencing actually has led to a long tail of distributions of cancer drivers, as you can see here. There's a lot of overlap in terms of the genetic mutations that happen across different cancers. And often, it's not just the primary mutations that we need to take a look at, we need to really understand the long tail of these mutations. And sometimes the actionable insights lie in the long tail. And for any human being to take a look at 
the entire genomic sequence for a cancer and be able to correlate that with uh, the actionable insights in terms of treatments, the actionable insights that come from the literature that connects to all these mutations. Every day, practically 8,000 publications are coming out in the, in the field of cancer. And then connecting it to the myriad of clinical trials which are going on based on these mutations is an uphill task. It could take literally weeks to interpret that. And that's where Watson is trying to help in terms of bending the cost of interpretation of the genomic sequence that you get from the cancers, as well as having actionable insights that can actually lead to better outcomes for patients. So shown here is uh, the good news and the bad news. The cost per genome has been going down um, over the last 10 years. Today you can easily get your genome sequence for less than $1,000. And it's not just the uh, sequencing that you get from companies like uh, 23andMe and others, but all the whole genome sequencing, not just a few genes here. But the cost of interpretation of all the genomes that are being sequenced for any cancer is going up because more and more information means you have to devote more and more resources. So back in 2012, 95% of the cost was in genotyping. Today, 95% of that cost has shifted to the interpretation side of things. Now, how did IBM get into uh, cancer and genomics? It was actually because of a show that we did where Watson competed in Jeopardy back in 2011 and a myriad of different uh, requests came to us from oncologists and uh, pathologists to see if we could actually use Watson to assist them, to augment their capabilities, not to replace them, but to augment their capabilities um, with interpreting the inf information that Watson could handle. So if you can please show the video. You got it. Watson? What is it? Sauron? Sauron is right, oh. and that puts you into a tie for the lead with Brad. The double jeopardy round of the first game I thought was phenomenal. Watson went on a terror. Watson. Who is Franz Liszt? You are right. What is violin? Good. Who is the church lady? Yes. <laughs> Watson. What is narcolepsy? You are right, and with that, you move to 36000 $681. The risk was, Ken gets a daily double, bets big, gets it right, he's gonna be well ahead, and then with that kind of lead going into Final Jeopardy, if he bets enough, he could end up winning the match. Ken, what's a committee? We gotta find that last daily double. We gotta find that last daily double. It was a crucial moment in the game. There was still a daily double on the board, and it was starting to become uh, pretty clear that it was in the legal ease category. Let's go to legal ease for 1,200. Watson. What is executor? Right. Same category, 1600. Answer, daily double. <laughs> that was the moment when I knew it's over. The category is 19th century novelists. What Watson wants to do then is preserve the lead, not take a big risk, especially with Final Jeopardy, because just like for humans, Final Jeopardy is hard for Watson. Now we come to Watson, who is Bram Stoker and the wager. Hello, 17,973, and a two-day total of 77,147. Back to the slides. Uh, so IBM did not just wake up one day in the year 2011 and win Jeopardy. Five years of research went into machine learning, deep learning, um, random forest computing, natural language processing to get to this stage. And, uh, you know, we're elated that we actually were able to be the two best uh, players in Jeopardy around the world. But what the oncologists and the uh, pathologists in uh, Memorial Sloan saw was something different. They saw at the bottom of the screen when Watson was coming up with answers, there was a certain probability associated with these answers. And they looked at this and said, isn't that the way we treat disease? We believe that because of certain conditions the uh, patient presents, and the data we have, the clinical data, the radiological data that we have, we try to make uh, an educated guess on what treatments would ultimately result in better outcomes. And we have certain probabilities associated with it. What if we could use the same kind of analysis with the vast area of literature, 
clinical trials, drugs which are out there, and actually come up with the best answer for what would lead to the best outcomes for the patient. So since Jeopardy, we have proceeded with many collaborations with Memorial Sloan and others to the point when we actually launched the business of IBM Watson Health in 2015. And today, we have collaborations across the world on genomics, on clinical trial matching, and oncology. And we actually have commercial products in, in all of those arenas, which I'm not going to go into. But our collaborators at Illumina, the Broad Institute, Mayo Clinic, Quest Diagnostics, um, community hospitals like Jupiter in Florida, Jupiter Memorial Hospital in Florida, and uh, Manipal University in India are working with us to actually take the information that has been generated with our partners across the globe for Watson for Oncology and Watson for Genomics and using that. So Watson for Genomics, as I said, is all focused on interpretations. And it is really looking at the variant analysis, the interpretation of that, the molecular profile analysis, the pathway analysis, and ultimately the drug analysis and correlating all to what's out there in the content of the literature that Watson can ingest and read up at an amazing pace. Um, so that's what Watson does and generates a report based on the cancer mutations that are observed uh, in a patient. Um, we have a whole range of universities who are working with us at this point. University of North Carolina actually uh, worked with us and found that in 99% of the cases, the, the tumor board and Watson agreed on the interpretation. But in 30% of the cases, Watson came up with something new, which was actionable. Dr. Ned Shopless, uh, shown here at the University of North Carolina, was, uh, work, worked, worked closely with us, and now he's the head of uh, NCI in the US, the National Cancer Institute. And uh, you can read his comments uh, over here in the slide, where uh, um, it is very clear that uh, he considered that Watson came up with actionable information that could be used. Um, more recently, we published a paper with the New York Genomics Cent Genome Center where Watson was able to read in less than 10 minutes what would have taken 160 hours of human analysis and curation and arrived at similar uh, conclusions for a patient who had end-stage glioblastoma. Liquid biopsies, uh, and as the clock is uh, ticking, I'm going to just accelerate and say that when you have uh, cancer, from the tumor, there's a variety of cargo that floats in the blood. You can take a draw of blood, centrifuge it, and at the top, you'd get the plasma from which you can actually extract fragments of cancer DNA. And uh, this is uh, a cartoon of uh, what typically happens when uh, patients undergo surgery. After surgery, it's very common for the cancer surgeon to come up and say, I got it all, the four very, very uh, commonly heard words. The truth is, nobody knows whether you've got it all or not. I'll show you an example of where this is so true. Patient comes in, before surgery, you see a lot of the red stuff, that's the cancer DNA floating in the blood. Surgery is done. The next day, you look at the blood, the, the, uh, the mutation in the DNA fragments, so the DNA fragments with cancer has kind of gone down, as you can see, day one. Day two, some of it is back. Day four, they, or day, day, day 42, actually, some of it is back. Day 224, a lot more comes back. So what's happened here? The cancer has come back, and the surgeon did not get it all. Now, the lessons from this really is you can actually detect cancer in the blood even when the CT scan on day 42 says it's negative, and you can actually intervene faster. Flipping it, in a lot of cancers, you don't need to do surgery and chemotherapy. If all the DNA fragments disappeared on day one, you could actually make a call in 99% of the cases that you do not need to follow a surgery with chemotherapy. And uh, lessons like this are being constantly learned as we are looking at the world of liquid biopsy. The other revolution that's going on, and some of you may know about it, FDA has first issued, has issued for the first time, approval for a cancer drug from Merck that actually targets specific mutations regardless of where the tumor actually is. So this is the first, for the first time, drugs are coming out in the market based on genomic pathways and not anatomical location. And uh, again, going back to Bert Vogelstein's comment uh, back in the 90s that cancer is a genetic disease, it is coming a full circle now back to where drugs are being specifically targeted 
at the genomic pathway. And I'll end here with uh, a patient that actually benefited from uh, Watson's interpretation of the lung cancer disease that he had and was able to come up with the recommendations for Jupiter Co Community Memorial Hospital in Florida in terms of the treatment. And I'll ask the folks at the back to play the video. Federal government requires that uh, all CDL drivers have a physical. And my doctor sent me for a chest x-ray. And there was a spot that glowed in the dark. We did the operation that was standard for him. He went a nice long period, but again, the reoccurrence popped up. Of course, he was somewhat uh, depressed and saddened by that. But I told him, you come to the office, you meet all the doctors again, we'll have a discuss, and also that we will use an IBM Watson to help determine what will be the next phase of treatment. So we ran the IBM Watson, and sure, it came up with a PDL1 inhibitor as a first line of treatment. And I said, here's again evidence based medicine because we scrolled down on the uh, screen and we were able to show the paper that was presented just a month previous to him coming in to see us. And that he saw that there were other people who were going through this and that there was hope for him to achieve his goals. In my case, what Watson came back with was exactly what they said that they wanted to do. Now with all this new treatment and everything, I'm confident I'm gonna be here a long time. Thank you very much.